to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. But Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason also the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth herself has conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called infertile is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the Lord's bondservant may have done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of God. Welcome. We are going to sing our first hymn on the front of your bulletin, Angels We Have Heard on High. Let's sing it together. Angels we have heard.
reading from Luke chapter 1. So our scripture reading is just a little further down from where we read at the beginning of our meeting today. It's going to be from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 56. Luke 1, verses 46 through 56. And if you're able, please stand with me as we read God's word together. My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has had regard for, my humble, for the humble state of his bondservant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is to generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are poor and who are proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has given help to his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, just as he spoke to our fathers through Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of God. You may be seated. I'm really happy to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I'm happy to see what the Lord has done and is doing in our little group. And I'm extremely grateful, thankful to God um, that we were able to do this, to meet together and study the Word together and have fellowship and friendship and it's uh, it's something that I've I felt like this is what God has called me to do in my life is this and, and I, I would do it even if only one person came I would still do it I would still preach um, even just to one person and um, but we are more than one praise the Lord and, and it's, it's a great honor to share the word with you. And I'll, I'll never forget that. I'll, I'll never allow that to be something which is, becomes commonplace to me or uh, somehow less, less than important. Uh, because what we're doing here in studying the word of God is, in, in my estimation, the best possible use of our time. It really is the best use of our time. There's lots of ways we could use our time, but this is the best way, I think. And this is the way that God has ordained, through the preaching of the Word, to save souls and to draw people to Himself. And... Uh, what a great privilege and honor it is to take some part in that and fellowship with you together as we do this. That's what the church has always done from the very beginning. And uh, I'm grateful to meet right now, um, today, as, as we look forward toward Christmas. I've always loved Christmas. It's always been my favorite time of year uh, ever since I can remember and so preaching a, a, a Christmas passage I think it's appropriate um, every year I you know I, I was telling someone the other day that I don't understand pastors who do an Advent series four or five sermons sometimes leading up to Christmas or Christmas Eve, and then, a, then they'll preach a Christmas Eve sermon, and then they'll preach a Christmas sermon. And the reason I don't understand that is, unless you're only going to be a pastor for three or four years, 
and you're going to run out of passages that are Christmas related. So, so I like to just do one, one a year and go off of whatever series I'm talking about at the moment and focus on the birth of Christ. And so we're going to do that today. Look at the Magnificat from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 56. Um, one other thing I'd like to notice that um, there were times when I was the senior pastor at another church and we had two services that I would preach the same message at both services and sometimes people would um, come and listen to both of them actually there was a number who did that come and they would listen to the same and both were the same sermon um, and they always said that the second sermon was completely different than the first sermon. Um, and so you'll, since I preached this message this morning, and some of you were with me as I did at uh, Christian Liberty Church, Life of Christian Life Liberty Church, that's what it's called, right? Yeah, <laughs> something. Um, you'll have to tell me if that's actually the case. Well, in Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel made what is probably the most earth-shattering announcement in history to a young virgin girl in Nazareth named Mary. She would bear a son who would be called the Son of the Most High, and he would reign over a kingdom which would never end. Sometimes we can become so familiar, not just with Christmas passages, but with any passage of the Scripture that we read it and we don't really stop and think about what is going on in the passage in, in which we're looking at. Um, and its gravity may elude us, but if we put ourselves in Mary's shoes for a second and meditate on what it had to be like that an angel of the Lord appeared in front of her and gave her these glad tidings. I mean, I mean, apart from the fact that his message to her was a good message, and it was good news, the reality is it's still uh, an angel. Something supernatural is happening here outside of the, you know, fleshly world. And an angel appears before a young woman. Um, I've told people this before that I've actually prayed to God that I would never see an angel with my mortal eyes. I don't want to see an angel in this world because I believe that if I do, I will have a heart attack. I'm already middle-aged, and I don't think that, that my constitution could handle a bright, shining, brilliant angel suddenly appearing in the midst of the room or in my bedroom or something. So uh, I've literally asked the Lord, Lord, just let the first angel that I ever see be the angel that takes me into your presence. That's the angel I want to see the first time. And uh, so far, he has heard my prayer. Thank God. But we sometimes perhaps even entertain angels unaware, so that's possible as well. Well, so for this woman, an angel appears to her. She obviously is very troubled by it. She knows that it's an angel, and the angel um, has a greeting for her saying that she's going to bear the Messiah. Um, she's from this nowhere town of Nazareth. That's also pretty amazing, too. That's because when uh, Jesus was calling the first disciples, one of them said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth, and forgive me if any of you are from this place, but when I think of Nazareth, I think of Cicero, Illinois. I think of, like, like just kind of a, a place where someone would say, can anything good come out of Cicero? Betty Lauren Maltese was the mayor back in the day, if you remember. And, I mean, it's like, like sort of out in Podunk and... and, and has not the greatest reputation. And that's where Nazareth was. And that's where she's from. And 
she's a woman that otherwise no one would have thought twice about. A young girl about to be married to Joseph. And yet she's given the greatest responsibility that anyone has ever had to be the mother of Jesus. And her response to the angel is probably why the Lord chose her for this amazing responsibility. She said to the angel, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And then she went in haste to the hill country in the town of Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth, her cousin, heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, because Elizabeth is very old. She was barren, had never had a child. The Lord um, greeted her before Mary and said that she also would have a baby, and the baby that was in her womb was John the Baptist. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, um, and she exclaimed with a loud cry when Mary came in, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? I'll pause there for a second. That's pretty amazing, too. The fact that Elizabeth is very obviously Mary's elder. She's so old that it's a miracle that she herself would have a baby. Um, Gabriel says that. She's barren and, and she's in her old age. And then Gabriel says, but nothing is impossible with the Lord. And so this woman has a miraculous baby inside of her as well, even though it is a natural baby. Her and Zechariah conceived the child by natural means. Obviously, Jesus was not conceived by natural means. Jesus' Father is God the Father. But still, it's supernatural. It's a miraculous thing because she was not able to have children. And then God granted that. And what Elizabeth says to Mary is, Why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? That's an incredible honor that she gives to her very young cousin. The Holy Spirit obviously revealed to Elizabeth that Mary would be carrying the Messiah. And then... Elizabeth says, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. In fact, Mary acknowledges that all generations will call her blessed. Why does Elizabeth say this the third time in verse 45? Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what God had spoken to her from the Lord. Well, if we go back to verse 18, we see something really hilarious that Elizabeth is alluding to. And Zechariah, that's Elizabeth's husband, said to the angel, How shall I know this? That is, how shall he know that what Gabriel said to him is going to happen is really going to happen? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him. And like, something about this is really profound. I am Gabriel. <laughs> Just, you know, inflection matters when we're reading the scriptures, right? It can actually change the way that we see a passage. Just in the way that we see the inflection of the passage. Uh, even though there's no inflection inherently in the words. I can imagine Gabriel says it like this. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Right? I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things come into place, uh, take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And then Zechariah was silent. Because he had more force Gabriel. He had more. Gabriel. Right. Right. And so when Elizabeth says in verse 45, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. At the time when Elizabeth says that, her husband is still mute. 
He still cannot speak. And so she's saying to, to Mary, well, at least you believed it. My husband didn't. He's not able to talk right now. Okay, so that's an amazing thing. She's incredibly blessed. And she has this remarkable um, response to the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word, to, to the angel. And so in our passage today, we're going to see Mary's heart as she gives glory to God and the wonderful lesson of God's faithfulness to her and to all generations through the son that she was carrying. Let's just pray one more time and ask the Lord to be with us now as we study his word. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for your marvelous grace and your love to us. Thank you for the pattern of faith that we see displayed in Mary's life. How her number one uh, goal in life was to be in submission to you and in obedience to you. And that she was willing so quickly to deny herself, to deny all of her dreams for the future, and to lay down her vision for her own life so that she could follow the will of God. And I pray that we would do the same thing, that you would enable us to have that same kind of faith that Mary had. Speak to us now through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to read, just so we have the context, I'd like to read from verse 26 onward in Luke 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying. And she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. We just pause there for a second. Even just right there in verse 32 and 33 of our text. We see multiple places of Old Testament prophecy that are being fulfilled in Christ. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. God promised David that that was going to happen, that he would have a descendant who would sit on his throne and establish his kingdom forever. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. He is the true Israel. He is the one whom all Israel was pointing forward to. And of his kingdom there will be no end. That's what Isaiah says about the child who is going to be born in Isaiah chapter 9. Is he will establish a kingdom which will never end. I mean, three prophecies just in one or two verses that are one, two, three, Gabriel is giving them to Mary. And certainly Mary was a devout Jewish girl. She knew who Yahweh is, and she trusted in him, and she knew what Gabriel was talking about. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, or how will this be, since I am a virgin? Let me just say one other thing. Um, it's, it's all right, I think, to sing the song, Mary, Did You Know?, but it's not a very honest song because Mary knew a lot. All the things, these things about Jesus were told to her before she ever bore him. So she knew who she was having. She knew that he'd be the Son of the Most High. She knew. Now, she might not have had the fullest understanding of what was going to happen in her son's life. I mean, when Simeon sees Jesus in the temple, he says to Mary, a sword will pierce your own heart too. And obviously because she has to watch her son die, and I don't think she really understood all of that and all the ramifications of those things. But she definitely believed 
that he was conceived by supernatural means by the power of the Holy Spirit. She knew she's a virgin. That's why she says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Right? She knows she might be a young Alma, a young woman, probably 13 or even 14 years old. But she's not dumb. She knows about the birds and the bees. Okay? People grew up younger in those days, especially because in a lot of cases the average life expectancy was 30 or 40 years, period. So they had to have babies at a young age. And she knew what having a child entailed, even though she had never known a man in that way. How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So she knew her child is the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age also has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her um, who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said that most Protestants don't have a higher regard for Mary. It's okay for us to have our spiritual heroes and admire people like Abraham or Moses or Joshua or David or Charles Spurgeon or Martin Lloyd-Jones or R.C. Sproul or whoever else is the guy you like and you like to quote to people. But when it comes, especially to Reformed people or people who travel in Reformed circles, when it comes to Protestants, Someone says, wow, Mary was such a woman. What a woman of faith. It seems like our immediate reaction to that is, well, you know, she was just a regular woman. There's nothing special about her. She was not a co-redemptrix with Christ. Well, look, I'm not saying she was a co-redemptrix with Christ. That's what the Catholics say. The Catholics say that we should pray to her. The Catholics say that she has a... A special in with her son. That's not what we believe. Absolutely not. But at the same time, the pendulum now has swung so far to the other side that we almost dismiss her. We say that she's not very remarkable. When the reality is, um, at least in my opinion, I believe that Mary was one of the most remarkable servants of God who ever lived in the history of the world. Ever. And the faith that she displayed by saying, let the word, let the Lord's will be done, may it be, as you have said, is just as great a faith as Noah exhibited when God said to him, build an ark, even when there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Uh, just as great. And her responsibility was even greater than Noah's. Noah's responsibility is just to build the ark and get inside. Her responsibility is to be the mother of the Christ. What do you think about that? Okay. <laughs> Truly, it's hard enough being a sinful father of a sinner. But I can't imagine being a sinful parent of a child who never sins. Can, can, you, can you imagine that? Like, I'm sure there were instances in Jesus' childhood where he was like, Mom, you know you shouldn't be doing that. Right? Like, like she never had to discipline him, ever. He's the per he is the perfect child, literally. She's called to be his mother. It's incredible. Incredible. And though we must profoundly disagree with Catholics based on this text where Mary says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Therefore, she acknowledges her need of a Savior. So we do not believe she's a co-redemptrix. We do not believe that she had sinless perfection. Though we disagree, still it is not wrong to honor her and to call her blessed. She says... All generations will call me blessed. And it's true. I mean, it's true. She's the one who bore Christ in her own womb. It's 
truly remarkable. The angel Gabriel said that Mary was favored by God, that the Lord was with her, that of all women in history, she was chosen to bear the Messiah of Israel. Three times Elizabeth calls her blessed. Just when all of her plans for a nice, quiet life with her fiancé Joseph were about to come true, she suddenly hit with the fact that nothing would be as she thought. And her response is, as I've already said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And right after she said that in verse 38, it says, And the angel departed from her. I mean, there's nothing left for him to say. She gave her acknowledgement. She said yes and amen. He didn't have to coax her. He didn't have to convince her. Have you ever notice how many times in the scriptures people ask the Lord for some kind of sign that what he says is going to happen? Like Gideon, Lord, I'm going to put this fleece out, and if you make that wet but the ground dry, I'll know that you've chosen me to go and fight. And so he does it. Lord, please don't let your anger burn against me now as I ask a second time. Now let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. And the Lord, in just amazing, great mercy, says, okay, and then does it too. We see, Zechariah, how will I know that these things are going to happen? Like, it's amazing. It, that actually happens pretty often, where people question the Lord. But in her case, there is absolutely no question. The only question she has is how. Not whether it will happen, but how will it happen? How can this be since I'm a virgin? That's her question. And she's just curious because she knows this is not normal. It's pretty amazing. And so she says, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Is that our reaction when our plans are interrupted or crushed by the Lord? Is that our reaction? I can just say from my own personal experience that it's really hard to have that heart disposition in our daily lives. Even when very, very small plans get changed, it's like, oh Lord, why? Why can't I go to the football game? Like, <laughs> it's so crazy. And here's Here's Mary, who had plans for a life with Joseph, plans for a family, plans for an awesome wedding. And now she shows up after being in Elizabeth's house for three months with a baby bump. She shows up and, you know, I'm certain, even though the text doesn't say here or in Matthew, I'm certain that she tried to explain to Joseph how the baby got there, but Joseph... Obviously, he knows how the birds and the bees work, too. And he made plans to divorce her quietly. And it was only because the Lord revealed himself in a dream to Joseph, saying, Joseph, it's okay for you to take her to be your wife. What is in her is from the Holy Spirit. And then Joseph's amazing faith to accept that and not question that. For Joseph not to say, wow... Did I take some psilocybin mushrooms before I went to sleep tonight? Am I hallucinating? But he doesn't. Because this couple is truly remarkable. Like, for real. Joseph and Mary. I, I, I think they're just prime and wonderful examples of what godly people should look like. Joseph is too. How easy is it for us to display sinful frustration when we don't get our way? 
And yet, here's a woman whose life has literally been turned upside down. And she is in submission to God's will. It just reminds me of what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, Let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Um, you know, when Jesus' birth was announced, that's almost the same thing that Mary said. That your will be done, Lord, instead of mine. What's our reaction when our plans are interrupted? Especially if our life is at stake. As Mary's life was actually at stake. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And so even though she did not commit adultery, it sure looks like that to anyone who takes a look at her and knows that she's not married to Joseph. They haven't had the wedding day yet. They haven't consummated their marriage. She goes out of town and she comes back pregnant. And showingly pregnant. So that Joseph takes one look at her and says, I know what happened. She went to go visit her cousin, met some guy, got with him, and now she's pregnant now. Even though she had a marital contract with Joseph. She could have been stoned. We see in, what is it, John chapter 8, we see that that very law in Leviticus 20 was what the Pharisees were trying to carry out with a woman who was caught in adultery. That very thing, to stone her to death for doing that. And yet despite all of the fears of those things, Mary says, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Oh, she was not so tethered to this world that when the voice of the Lord called her to deny it, she couldn't do it. No, when the voice of the Lord called her to deny all of her plans, to deny all of her pride, to know even that anyone that she ever told this story to who knew her, people in the town who knew her, no one would believe it. No one would. And she knew that. She knew that no one would believe it. Of course, eventually, Jesus grows up, and by that time, people simply thought that he was the son of Joseph. They hadn't remembered that she had come into town pregnant. Or maybe it's a different, obviously, different people. And so we're going to look at three reasons in Mary's song why Mary magnifies the Lord. It's called the Magnificat because she magnifies the Lord in it. The first reason that Mary magnified the Lord in verses 47 and 49 is because of what he had done for her. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humblest state of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations shall call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. She calls God her Savior. The first thing that she did is acknowledge both her need of salvation and God's provision of that salvation. Gabriel told Mary to name her baby Jesus, which means the Lord saves. Oh, how this statement from Mary herself utterly crushes the idea that she was sinless. If she was sinless, she would not have needed a Savior. She would not have called God her Savior. The reason that she called God her Savior is because she beheld herself as she truly was, as a sinner in need of saving, as someone who is in need of grace. And how the words of the prophet Isaiah must have sprung into living color right before her mind's eye. 
For a child will be born to you, a son will be given, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. Angel Gabriel tells her he's going to set up a kingdom which will never end. And these prophecies of the Old Testament are flashing before her. She says, God has been good for, to me. He has done these things for me. He chose me before the foundation of the world. And she acknowledges God's mindfulness of her in her humble estate, and how God had so lifted her up that all generations would call her blessed. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. See that? In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And Gabriel says, that Mary is blessed. So what does that mean? That she's blessed. And I would even say the Lord chose her for this mighty task. This marvelous assignment. Because she was poor in spirit. He chose her. Because that is the disposition that he gave to her heart. She was humble. She recognized her need of him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I mean, Mary was so blessed, and her spirit was so poor in that she recognized her humble estate, that she not only received the kingdom of heaven, she received the king of heaven. The king of heaven. In her body. Growing from a her placenta, right, is nourishing Jesus. It's just the most profound and incredible thing like ever, right? Next to the resurrection of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ is right up there. I think if, uh, you know, if a person denies that, then they need to really question their salvation. And this is an integral part of the gospel, actually. And look what the Lord does to those who are humble. He raises them up. He raised her up in, in Isaiah chapter 40, starting at verse 1. It says this, Isaiah 40, I want to read 1 to 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. And the rough place is plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See, God saved Mary, and he raised her up. And third, she says, he has done great things for me. From the foundation of the world, the Lord had Mary in mind. In the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve sinned, God promised that he would send a deliverer. The seed of a woman will crush the head of the serpent. Genesis 3.15. The seed of what woman? The seed of this woman. This is the woman whom God himself told Adam about. This is the the daughter of Adam and Eve that would bear the person who would crush the head of the serpent. All the way back in Genesis 3, in the fall, in the garden, the Lord had Mary in mind. 
In Isaiah 7, God gives his prophet a sign. He says, the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. And you shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The virgin will be with child. And so when Mary says, how can this be since I am a virgin? Ah, Mary, it's because you are the person whom Isaiah was writing about. That's why. The virgin was Mary. Her son is Jesus, God with us. Truly the holy God had done great things for Mary. He saved her. He raised her up. He appointed her to be the mother of the Messiah. And the second reason that Mary magnif magnified the Lord is because of what he has done for us. Verses 50 to 53. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. This world is full of people who have no fear of or reverence for God. They live their lives as though God does not exist. But David declares in Psalm 14, 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. It might seem to us sometimes, if we look at such foolish people, those who deny Jesus, like they have everything together in their lives. They are well fed. They don't have any pains in their birth, says Asaph in Psalm 73. I mean, I mean, the pains in their death. They're, they're well-fed. They're rich. A lot of them are very powerful people. And for Asaph, the author of Psalm 73, he said, My foot had almost stumbled because of that. I almost thought, man, of what use is it to live for God? Of what use is it to deny myself and take up my cross, basically? Even though he doesn't use those words, that's what he's writing about. Maybe I should have been like those who deny God and are proud and haughty and have everything the world has to offer. And the world is a friend to them. And then Asaph says, ah, but if I would have opened my mouth and spoken to your people that way, I would have betrayed them. Because when I came into the temple and I saw the beauty of the Lord, when I saw the end of those who deny the Lord, then I realized, I realized the folly of that kind of life. That's the reason why Mary says here in our text, the same thing, same thing that Asaph said is what Mary is saying here. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate because like, like I said, God could have chosen for Christ to be born in Caesar's house. He could have chosen for Caesar's wife or someone like that to bear the Messiah, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he chose, chose someone from Cicero, Illinois, right? Like, I mean, no offense to those from Cicero. And he raised her up. And he gave her the most remarkable gift ever. And the greatest responsibility probably of anyone other than her son. Um, in history. God's mercy is for those who fear him. Who acknowledge his hand in the world. And his sovereignty. And who thus rightly see their own desperate need of his grace. To them he shows mercy and is faithful. But he scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God exalts the humble, says Mary. Those who are poor in spirit. Those who hunger for and thirst for righteousness. You see here in these verses that God turns the world and its values and its ways upside down. Because the world will say to you, whoever has the most money is the one that you should be like. And, and you should try to become that kind of person. The world will say to you that those who are proud and who 
take what they want. Those are the kinds of people that succeed. But isn't it true, don't we see it so often in the scriptures, that what the Bible says about reality is the exact opposite of what the world says about reality? It's the exact opposite. I could almost tell you everything that the Bible says by just saying the opposite of what the world says. Right? Without even having a Bible. Because the, the Bible is so contrary to the world and the world's view and, and what it means to live a life which is pleasing to God. Christ does not come into this world to be born in a palace. He came in a lowly state in order to save the lowly. We see this in Paul's statement to Timothy, where Timothy, uh, he says in chapter 1, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Jesus himself says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Until one recognizes, confesses their lowly estate, Christ has absolutely nothing positive to say to that person. There are those whom Jesus has not come to call. He says, I have not come to call those who think that they're righteous. I've not come to call those who think that they're healthy. He has nothing positively to say to the self-righteous and self-proclaimed healthy people. The only thing that he has to say to those people is repent, and how shall you escape the fire of hell? That's the only thing he has to, to say to them. But to those who understand their utter des desperate need of Christ, their dependency upon Christ. To them, he says, I've come to save you. You're sick and I'm the physician. I'm able to heal you. I'm able to forgive your sins and to cleanse you and to draw you into the kingdom and into new life. Mary magnified the Lord because of that. The third way that Mary magnified the Lord is because of what he had done for Israel. Look at um, verses 54 to 55. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. From the time of the fall in the garden, God had promised to send a deliverer. He promised to Abraham that all nations would be blessed through him. He promised to Moses that he would raise up a prophet like him and that we should listen to him. He promised David that one of his descendants would reign on his throne forever. He promised Isaiah that a child would be born and a son would be given. He promised Jeremiah that he would inaugurate a new covenant and by it, write his law on our hearts. He promised Ezekiel that he would take out our heart of stone and give his people a heart of flesh to believe all of these things. Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Hosea, I mean Micah. We can keep going. All the prophets, they were all looking forward to Christ. To the Messiah of Israel. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. They were all looking forward to him. They were all proclaiming him. And then Jesus says in Matthew 13. For truly I say to you. Many prophets. Many righteous people. I mean, what he means when he says righteous people. Are not those who are self-righteous. Those who are made righteous by faith. Those like Abraham. Whom the Lord counted righteous. Because he believed in God and in God's promise. Many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Do you know 
Can I just say, honestly, uh, I believe that those words of Christ apply to us today and not only to those who saw him in the flesh. That we, we who are in this room, we are people who have seen the full revelation of God in the scriptures. We have that. And that is so much more than people in the Old Testament were able to see of who Christ is. They, they could not get a clear picture. They did not understand. Some of the prophets had some of the pieces of the puzzle. But none of them saw entirely what it was going to be. I believe that through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that now indwells every believer in Christ, that we therefore have more insight and more understanding and more knowledge about who Jesus the Messiah is than Isaiah ever did. Because we have all the prophets and all the apostles teaching already. And it's for us right here in the book. A book that so many of us don't even pick up and read very often. And I can honestly say that there are many people in the world right now that could just wish that they could meet in a room and hear the preaching of the Word of God. And they're not able to. They're not able to. And can you imagine living in North Korea? Truly. I believe, actually, just as a side note, I believe that there are Christians in North Korea uh, because there were Christians in North Korea before the uh, Kim family took over there. And there was a church there. And the Kim family took over and they were dictators and they, you know, made a false pagan idolatry of um, Kim Il-sung and then Kim Jong-il and then Kim Jong-un. And, you know, they think, they portray that that's the only God that the people of North Korea worship. I believe that there's true Christians who are still there. Underground, underground church. I mean, I know that uh, because I know Christians who have gone there and visited there and preached the gospel secretly to the risk of their own lives. And, um, and I just think, what would those people give to just be able to be here right now? Like now in some of these seats. They trade everything. Everything they had for that. Not because of me. Just because of the Bible. Because they're not able to hear the things that we're able to hear. To see the things that we're able to see. Because if they get caught with one of these, their whole family will be crucified. Or shot with an anti-aircraft gun. That's what happens. I think especially... Especially uh, those of us who live here uh, need to take heed of Leonard Ravenhill's exhortation, best book title I ever heard before, Sodom Had No Bible. Sodom Had No Bible. They had no Bible, yet God still rained fire down on them. They had no prophets other than Lot. Lot, in my opinion, is pretty compromised, even though he's a righteous man, according to Hebrew. I have to, I have to, you know, believe that. Or is it, is it, is it Peter? Second Peter? Jude. Anyway, Jude, I'm sorry. Um, that Lot was a righteous man. He was grieved in his righteous heart by the things that he was seeing. But, you know... You look at his life and he, he had some compromise there. They had no churches in Sodom. They had no radio programs in Sodom. 
They had no televisions in Sodom. And yet God still judged them. And that, that's the reason why Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles performed in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in dust, dust and ashes long ago. But as it is, it will be more bearable in the judgment for them than it will be for you. The reason that Jesus says that about Chorazin and Bethsaida is because they were able to see things that Tyre and Sidon were never able to see. They heard the word preached in a way that Tyre and Sidon never heard the word preached. They saw the miracles of Jesus. Tyre and Sidon did not see the miracles of Jesus. And yet Tyre and Sidon were judged. And therefore what Jesus is saying is that in the end, when the final judgment happens, those of us who have greater access to the word of God, to the preaching of the word, to the ministry of the word, We'll be judged more strictly. That's the whole point. That's his point. Jesus says, Cruelly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And I think when I read that, Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Because that's true of me. And the question is now, what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? Oh, what a wonderful example Mary is of faith and obedience and self-denial. So what does Mary teach us about the worship of God? And about true worship? Because that, that's really what she's doing. Here, when she gives her song of praise, she's giving worship to God. Oh. First thing she teaches us is submission to God and to God's will is always what's best for us, even if it's not the comfortable thing. To do what God tells us to do, to deny ourselves and listen to the voice of Jesus is always what is best. And that was obviously played out in her life. And I, I believe it's, we can see ways for those of us who are Christians to, that where that's played out in our lives too. Where we had opportunities to not listen to God um, and saw how that worked out. And we've had other opportunities to listen to God and to deny ourselves and see how that worked out. We can never go wrong following Jesus. Secondly, we see God's faithfulness and goodness displayed here. She's grateful to the Savior of souls, to the goodness of God in choosing her among all women who would ever live to be the mother of the Christ. Oh, can we think of ways in which we are thankful to God for what He has given to us? You know, you know, I have to say, um, I have to say this, and then I'll be finished. Um, I've heard Christians say recently that 2020 is such a hard year. It's been a hard year for all of us. Can't wait for 2020 to be over. 2020 has been the worst year of any of our lives. It's so awful. 2020, man, we're in the middle of this pandemic and all this terrible stuff is happening. People are dying and everything's closed and it's so awful. Can't wait for this year to be over. There's a sense in which I can understand that sentiment. I personally, on a personal level, this year, from last January until now, has been the most trying and difficult year of my entire life for a variety of reasons. And I have shed many, many tears over the course of the last 12 months. But I can't say that this is a bad year. I don't blame God for any of that. 
God truly, even in the furnace of affliction and sorrow, is working for my good and for his glory. In the furnace of affliction and sorrow of any of our lives, God is working, if you believe in him and love him, for your good, good and for his glory. He is doing that in all of us. And I, you know, because of that, because I know that that's true, what can I complain about? Honestly, what can I complain about? I can't, I can't complain. He's rescued me from the hell of fire where I would be forever outside of him. Man, that alone has the power to lift my soul up from any kind of despair that I Hell is the place where a person should rightly despair and have no hope. That's the only place where a person has no hope. As long as we have breath in our lungs in this world, there's always hope in Christ. And I should say reverse, as long as we have Christ, there's always hope in this world. And there's hope in the next world. Always. Always. And so, I don't like saying, I don't like that saying, um, you know, I can't wait for this year to be over. Like, as if what? As if two weeks from now is going to somehow change something? Like, as if the calendar flipping over to 2021 is somehow going to miraculously change everything? It's not going to change anything. It's just another day. And it's another day in this fallen world. Like, that's all it is. You know, there was a time, <laughs> there was a time I went to my old friend, Dr. Rafat Amari's house. Do you guys know, did you know the Amaris ever? No, Dr. Rafat Amari, he passed away, he's in glory now. He was a Muslim evangelist, a Christian evangelist to Muslims. Wonderful man of prayer. That guy could pray until everyone was asleep. And <laughs> anyway, and he would. And he used to, I'm not going to go second sermon here, just I have a point. That guy used to pray and pray and pray and he would call me up and say, David, you want to come to my house? We should have prayer together. Let's have prayer. He's a Jordanian. His whole family in Jordanian, former Muslims, who love Christ. And we would go over to his house, have four, five, six hour long prayer sessions with Dr. Amari. Wonderful, amazing. So one day, Dr. Amari asked me if I would go to his house on New Year's Eve. And, of course... I wanted to, like, watch the ball drop or watch some ridiculous thing on ABC or something. But I went. I went to his prayer thing. And, and we prayed. It's like 8 o'clock. And I had plans. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to leave here at 11 so I can go to a friend's house and hang out and have a beer or something. Scratch that from the recording. Um, you know, whatever. And I looked up at the clock. We started praying at 8. True story. I looked up at the clock, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and we were still praying. It was the most remarkable thing. Just remarkable. And there wasn't even a hint of disappointment inside of my heart that I had spent that time praying instead of watching a ridiculous ball drop from a building. Like, my point is this, that it's just another day. That's, that's all it is. It's just, it was just another day. And I was January 1st, you know. It's not going to change anything. But Christ has the power to change everything. Because in the midst of 
of whatever we're going through, no matter how long it lasts for, if we have Jesus, everything will be all right. And that's something that I have to preach to myself all the time. Yeah. And that's something that Mary lived out too. So it wasn't just like, okay, I'll, I'll be the mother of Jesus, and then, you know, great, and then I don't have to deal with pain and childbirth. No, I'm sure she still had to have, she gave a natural birth. It's still painful. It's still the curse. Amen. So when we think about this time of year and the culture trying to take our mind off of anything that has to do with Christ at all, we challenge all of us to remember Mary as she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And that should be our heart set as well. Let's pray. Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy to us. Thank you for giving us your Son. Thank you for the beautiful pattern of faith that Mary displays to us in the Magnificat. I pray that we would have the same kind of um, disposition that you would grant us the similar sort of faith and no matter what comes into our lives you would say let the Lord's will be done I am the Lord's servant so wonderful and I thank you for this group and for blessing us to be together I thank you I thank you for this year and I ask your blessing in 2021 let your blessing be most of all applied in this way, Lord, that we would know you more deeply, no matter what it takes for us to know you more deeply, and that we would live our lives in anxious anticipation of the day when we see you face to face, and in a grateful and glorious expectation of that. In Jesus' name I pray. going to sing Silent Night, one of my favorites. Every other year I used to have candles and we would do candlelight, but Tim forgot to bring them today. And so, so I'm just joking. Yeah, I, I would say we should turn off the lights, and but we're not into all that emotional nonsense. So uh, we can sing together <laughs> Silent Night. Let's sing it. Thank mm -hmm.
Resisted waving during my sermon, but now that my sermon is over, I feel like I can. Um, yeah, please come. Let's. I mean, I understand if, if people feel like they they don't want to for uh, because they have a conviction about um, the virus. That's okay. Um, that's okay. But I hope that that will be over soon. I I think it will. I think that the virus will be over soon and that we will be able to get on with normal life again. I certainly hope so. Um, but regardless, even if those who watch are not able to come, know that I still love you and the church here still loves you. And we're going we're gonna to continue to move forward with planting this church, um, Lord willing, unless... Christ comes back, or he takes us to be with him. Um, I'm going to give a benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.